Thank you very much. Um, so yes, hello. I'm here to talk about Dash, uh, and so this is a Dash is a framework that allows you to have um, interactive uh, data visualization web applications with minimal or no JavaScript. Um, and so just before I go on as well, um, these slides are actually themselves a web page. Um, and so if you want to follow along or look at these slides um, either uh, during the talk or a little bit later on, um, please do take those links down uh, and use them to uh, explore the, the various bits of code that are in this presentation. Um, <clears throat> an alternative title um, for this uh, particular talk is what you can, can't, uh, should, and also probably shouldn't do um, with Dash um, from the Plotly project. Um, and so throughout this talk, I'm going to give a brief introduction to Dash, um, how it works and what you can do with it, uh, discuss what we've learned at Decision Lab from using Dash across our various different projects, uh, and kind of identify or sort of uh, show up some areas that we think might be sort of good practice and lessons that we've learned. Um, I will be kind of looking for feedback on some of the thoughts and the ways that we're using Dash, and so please do um, ask a question at the end or grab me if you see me at the conference. And, and start talking about Dash, because it really is quite a young project, and it's something that we're very um, interested in. And I'd be very interested in collaborating with people to see how they're using Dash and where they can use Dash in the future. And um, just putting those links up there again, because I'm not sure that I've put them throughout the rest of the presentation. So um, I should also say as well, if you're really keen, um, there's a Docker uh, that you can start up in the um, examples uh, of the uh, Dash GitHub. Um, and the links in the slides will link to the Docker, so you can follow the, the presentation um, in the comfort of your own home. Uh, okay, uh, final point about the slides as well. If you are viewing them on the web, um, because I know that this is uh, recorded as well, um, every time you see one of those down emojis, push the down, um, the down button rather than the right-hand side button. Um, so, I <coughs> should also prefix this saying that I'm not um, a Dash expert, um, I'm not an author on the project, uh, you know, and if you are actually from the Plotly Dash project, um, and you know, anything I say is out of date or wildly contentious, please do get in touch. Um, I'm more than happy to correct anything or learn more about Dash. And um, so actually that does kind of pose a question, why on earth am I here if I'm not a, a Dash expert? Um, and more to the point as well, I'm a, um, my background is in full stack uh, web development. I'm a Python and JavaScript developer. Uh, so why am I using Python to write JavaScript? Well, um, to answer that question, um, as was uh, introduced before, I work for Decision Lab. We're a London-based mathematical modeling consultancy. Um, before I go on as well, I should say I'm very sorry about the state of my country at the moment and uh, Brexit. Please don't ask me about Brexit. I have no idea what's going on either. <laughs> so, um, but I should also invite you to another very fun Python conference, which is PyCon London, uh, which is, oh, sorry, PyCon UK, uh, which is in Cardiff this year in September. Uh, it's great fun. Please do come along and um, don't be put off by everything you read in the news about the UK at the moment. So, um, why are we using Dash at Decision Lab? Um, well, one thing that you might have identified at various Python conferences or at your company or um, your organization um, is that there are almost like two cultures of Python. Uh, I kind of call this like the, the Python data and the Python software cultures. Um, you'll, like, you'll kind of spot it in the developers that you meet or in the, the meetups that you attend. There are some uh, you know, Python courses which are very much focused on GPython notebooks, Pandas, SciPy, TensorFlow, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's also a community of software engineers that use Python and you know, hate GPython notebooks. Um, I sometimes fall into that camp. Um, but we'll use um, tools more like SQL Alchemy and the various other kind of database technologies and so on um, to actually kind of build production software. Um, so collaboration between these two cultures is very important, um, and it's something that we, we try and break down as much as possible at Decision Lab. Um, but it can be very time consuming. Um, and so what we were looking for, especially on a small project, I should say, um, so if you're building a big production web app, that's certainly something that you, you know, you're going to start on a very different approach. But if you've got a small project, a little bit of data analysis, and you want to do some visualization with it, you don't want to have to get a software engineer to start building all sorts of custom uh, JavaScript integrations between your, your Python code and your data science project. Um, it really is quite, quite a challenge. Uh, and so we wanted to minimize the new technologies that are maybe fresh uh, PhD graduates or um, maybe interns even would be able to kind of uh, minimize the new technologies that they would need to learn um, in order to be able to get a project off the ground. Um, <coughs> if, if, 
purely because if I'm building this kind of very basic proof of concept, um, I want a data scientist to be able to take the lead in the early stages, looking and exploring data, creating visualizations, and so on. If their background isn't in web development, then they might, you know, they're not going to be naturally placed to create a, a web application for their data. Um, and also, as a software engineer, I want to be able to facilitate members of my team to really go places and do exciting things with data without getting bogged down thinking about various different you know, JavaScript uh, callbacks and the latest React library and that kind of thing. Um, and so, uh, just to summarize exactly why this was a problem for us, um, React has a, uh, I hope you can see this, React has a very um, uh, uh, difficult reputation at times. Uh, it is quite a complex um, style of development to get your head into. Uh, and you can see here that um, this is uh, Thomas or Mark almost preparing to put together his Hello World React app. It's, it's a difficult language to learn, especially if your data, uh, if your background is more in a data science focus rather than um, a software engineer focused background. Uh, and so we found Dash. It's an open source project, uh, although there are paid options for consultancy with Plotly. Uh, and it describes itself still as experimental, although recently, I think that was about three weeks ago, it hit version one. So it's an established project, but um, like everything in JavaScript, it changes all the time. Uh, you can see the website here, it's uh, kind of very flashy, um, and they uh, you know, describe themselves as being able to build beautiful projects uh, with minimal involvement from, from JavaScript. And that's a good thing sometimes. Um, not having to use JavaScript is, in and of itself, helpful. Um, it certainly speeds up development for some project teams. But as I'll cover a little bit later on, it's not always, um, it's not always desirable to only use, only use uh, Dash. So for the rest of the talk, I'll just give a quick introduction to Dash and how it works. Uh, some examples of the uh, really cool things that you can do with Dash. Um, as I said before, some of those sort of tips on larger Dash projects uh, that we've developed at Decision Lab. Uh, and also discuss, as I mentioned before, when to stop using Dash and to start hiring uh, JavaScript engineers. And um, so let's start with the Hello World. Um, it's a uh, very um, kind of simple uh, syntax that hopefully, if you're familiar with Python, you'll uh, get to grips with quite quickly. Um, literally, you just install Dash via pip, um, and this is a simple Hello World script. So you can see here we've got, uh, you know, we're doing our imports. Uh, we create an app uh, on that line. Uh, we produce a layout, which in this case is a, a div tag, which is an HTML tag with a fundamental kind of division in HTML. Uh, and the children of that tag um, are going to be this uh, h1, or header1, um, so just a big header, uh, that says, hello, you're a Python. And then at the bottom, uh, we, run, uh, we run our app. Uh, and you just literally call it uh, like that. Now, if we, this is the moment of truth as to whether or not all of this works together. Um, but here we can see, yeah, okay, so we've got a hello world, um, or hello Euro Python um, example app in Dash. Um, I've cheated a little bit, I've put a style sheet on here to give us our logo and so on, um, but that's just completely by the by. Um, <coughs> so that's uh, the basic, very basic kind of hello world of, um, of Dash. There are two bits uh, of code there that are quite important that you should have a look at, and so there are two modules or libraries that are being used as Dash and Dash HTML components. So Dash HTML components uh, is a module which just wraps all the core React um, components. So uh, every single HTML tag has a corresponding React tag, um, and now every single React HTML kind of, uh, React component has a corresponding Dash component. Uh, and so you can plug and play these together, and then uh, Dash, the actual framework, um, manages the relationships between these particular tags, which I'll cover in a minute. Uh, and it serves the layout just using a really basic Flask interface. Um, and so you can actually provide your own custom Flask app as well that, and add all sorts of modules and routes onto there as well. Um, <coughs> but as I said in the title to this talk, um, I want an interactive web page, not just a hello world that serves some static data with a ton of Python on top of it. Um, so how do you go about doing that? Uh, now I'm going to detour very quickly to ask how would you do that in JavaScript? Um, I'm not sure what how familiar people in the room are with, with JavaScript. There might be some very experienced JavaScript engineers and some uh, people who never, never touched it in their life, so I'm going to give it an overview of how this would work. Uh, but fundamentally, we'll have two things on our web page. And so you can see on the top line there, uh, we've got this output, you might call it. So um, this is a paragraph tag that says, hello, and I said there for the time being. But our aim is to be able to take the name of our user um, or the person on our web page and say hello to that person. So we've got our output at the top there, and in particular, that spam tag, which is just um, another HTML tag, which is where we're going to place our user's name. 
Uh, and then there's this input tag as well, which is going to take some text input from the user, uh, and that has an ID of hello, uh, hello input, and the place it's going to go is ID hello name. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I fell for my own mistake there and pushed right rather than down. <laughs> um, so we can see here that uh, if we uh, look at the tree of those HTML objects, we've got, uh, I should say as well, that these are, um, you'll often hear, the, hear me referring to the DOM. Um, uh, this is the document object model. Um, I'm not vain enough to refer to web pages as myself. Um, I just happen to be a web developer called DOM. Um, so this is the document object model here. Um, so there are three, uh, there are three um, nodes here in our DOM. We've got our paragraph node, and then the child uh, of that paragraph node is this span node with that ID, hello name. The hashtag indicates an ID. Uh, and then we've got our input as well, which is hello input. And so we need to write a JavaScript um, that sets the value, or the inner HTML, as we call it, um, of the hello name span uh, to whatever the value of the input is at that particular time. Um, now, it's not good enough to just do this once as well. We have to monitor it so that every time that that value changes, um, we update our, our user. Also, uh, so that, that's what we need to do. Now, JavaScript, we can write a program directly that would um, monitor it constantly, say every second or so, or respond to an event. Um, but that's really time consuming and really quite difficult to keep on top of, especially in a larger app. So what React does is it lets us do this declaratively. Um, so rather than write our own scripts to do everything and kind of figure out everything that should go on the page, we just declare how this, um, the page should work, and then React figures everything out, works out a graph of how things are dependent on one another, and sorts everything out for us. And um, <clears throat> the important point to remember here, though, is that we're going to have to define the behavior um, of, or well, define um, how a change in the input should affect the, um, you know, the display that we have at the end of our output. Um, and so the syntax isn't really important. Um, but in React terminology, we say that input, uh, so the, the value of our input would be a prop um, to this span component. Um, and so we can define using this JavaScript syntax here that the, all that this does is say, um, I want to take the value that you give me from my input, and I'm going to put it inside of this span. Um, so yeah, that's a kind of a, uh, an example of how it would work in um, JavaScript. But if we wanted to see how it would work in Dash, um, we, we have a slightly similar, well, a similar concept, but one that's also different. Um, the key to interaction in Dash is a callback. And these define um, the relationships between the various different components. And you can think of this as being a little bit like Excel. Um, and so whenever the input to one particular component changes, um, the, uh, the functions run and its output is displayed somewhere as well. Uh, and so if we were to take a look at our Hello World and kind of update it, uh, you can see here that we're defining another layout. And so uh, we've got that div tag that we had before. And um, I've got this H1 that um, now I'm calling my H1, sorry, rather than hello name. Uh, and you can see here I'm going to set, uh, we've also got this input. So this comes from another Dash module called Dash Core Components, which is like the interactive Dash modules. Uh, and so we're giving this a name. Uh, I'm setting its initial value to Basel, uh, and its type is text as well. Uh, Sorry. So uh, next, we set the um, we define how this relationship works using our callback. Uh, and I'm sorry that the the text here is a little bit small because um, uh, it's a little bit uh, just the, the way it's spaced out to be um, compliant with black. Um, but you can see here we've got a decorator at the top, and we say what our inputs are. So in, in this case, it's just the the value of that uh, that text box, and our output is going to be the value or the HTML that's inside um, inside our header. And um, we get the value by running this function. Um, and here I've just used an f string to interpolate whatever the value is with hello. Uh, and so uh, again, we just run it as we did before. And now if I open this up, uh, hopefully you can see, sorry, it's a little bit small. But I could change something like this to be Switzerland or something. So we have um, an interactive web page now that takes a value from a user, displays it, um, and we haven't had to touch JavaScript once. Um, the, there is an important caveat to this um, before we kind of think about redesigning all of the web pages and software that you make. Um, the code that defines this relationship now lives uh, in Python, or it lives on our server. Um, whereas in a React app, all of this would be managed in the browser using um, React's kind of optimized uh, algorithms to do that. Uh, now, this involves a call to the server. 
and that has a big performance impact. Um, so every time that a user presses a key or does something on our web page, it means that we have to go to the server, ask what should the new web page look like, and then display that in, in our web page. So that's a big performance impact, but like I said at the start, you know, that's okay largely, because I want to build an app really, really quickly. Um, I want to use familiar technologies um, for data scientists, and I want to be able to make you know, just a proof, of, a proof of concept app or an alpha of some kind. I'm not looking to make production software um, using, using Dash. Um, so just to give another bit of a tour, you know, what can you actually do with Dash? Um, you know, some of the things that you can actually make are really quite impressive. So as the name kind of suggests, it's mostly geared towards dashboards. Um, but you can make some quite transactional and um, you know, interesting pieces of uh, you know, example software using it as well. Um, and so just to show how far you can go quite quickly, um, if you wanted to display data, for example, um, this is the Titanic data set. And so it's example three in this um, uh, GitHub uh, repository that you can take a look at. Um, and all we're doing here is, you know, there's a lot of code here, but it's not, not very complex. We've got our, our layout again, um, and we're just giving a header. Um, I'm also giving the option here to filter all of the passengers on the, so this displays the, uh, the entire manifest of the, the Titanic. I'm giving an option here to filter it based on sex. Uh, and you can see here that I'm just using this component, it's called the dash data table, um, and that will um, simply display all of the, uh, all of the columns in my, um, my data frame. Uh, I've got this callback as well, um, and you can see that this callback provides the value to that uh, dash table. Uh, and as its input, it takes the, the value of the dropdown at that particular given point. So whenever the dropdown changes, um, this function is run, and it will either give uh, all of the passengers on the Titanic or just the ones that match this particular criteria. Uh, and so that's literally all there is to it. So now if we wanted to uh, see our data set here, we've got a fully kind of interactive data set. This is a list of all of the, the passengers that are on the Titanic and all of the, um, all of the columns that are available. If I wanted to select just the women, uh, you can see that's now just displaying all the females, uh, and likewise with males. You can see here that we've we've got an interactive uh, interactive browser for our data set as well. Uh, no. Okay. <coughs> now, as uh, as I said at the start, this is a project from Plotly. Um, Plotly is obviously well known for its um, uh, you know its graphing technologies and its um, ability to produce uh, kind of data visualizations. Uh, and so it's no surprise that Dash also has a really rich set of um, essentially plotly graphs that you can use um, to uh, produce your own um, well, your own graphical visualizations of data. And so sticking with the Titanic data set, um, you can take a look at the code, but it's, it's a very, very straightforward um, Dash component where I just provide it with a couple of arguments um, to just like a standard plotly graph. And so now I've taken the Titanic data set, uh, and uh, this is the number of passengers on the Titanic by the first letter of their first name. Uh, and again, that's just a couple of lines of code to make a, you know, a, a, a web page visualization. No JavaScript involved, everything done in Python. Um, <clears throat> you can also uh, start to make some more interactive tools, um, like I mentioned before. So rather than just displaying data or you know, just taking little bits of data, if you wanted to start making changes to your data, say, um, you can uh, use this, uh, so this is an example here that gives you um, a simple to-do list. So you can see here I've got um, a list that displays all of my tasks. Uh, I've got an input that takes um, the text for a particular task, and I've got this button here. Uh, and I can use uh, the differences, uh, so I can use uh, the fact that whenever the button is clicked, um, I'm able to get the value of the particular task uh, and add that to a list. Um, again, if you can take a look in more detail at the code, uh, if you'd like on that repository. Um, I take the, the input to say whenever, I mean, to call my function whenever this button's pressed, uh, the state provides what the value of that function was at the particular time, uh, and now I can see it live uh, here. And so, for example, if we did, uh, to-do list, uh, get to Basel. Uh, you can see here that we're able to literally start creating um, interactive software. And so obviously that would be more uh, more useful here. I just stored this in a, a global list, but obviously you could link that to a database of some description or um, you know, anything else that you, you wanted to. So you can actually start to reduce very basic uh, user interfaces really quite quite quickly, not just data visualization. Uh, so, moving on. 
Um, <coughs> you can also build your own Dash components um, if you're familiar with JavaScript, um, but I should say that actually the Dash API does rather limit what you can do. Um, in particular, access to something we call Redux, which is um, a kind of internal database inside of your browser. Uh, and so apps can be a little bit uh, jittery at times without, without access to some of these kind of technologies. Um, but you can still go very far with Dash, and you can actually, uh, you know, I've listed a couple of the limitations here, you can actually really make some quite uh, impressive and useful bits of software without having to have any real knowledge of um, web development or how, how those things work. Um, for example, recently we um, had a project at Decision Lab looking for um, detecting illegal uh, gold mining in the Amazonian rainforest. Uh, and so we were able to make a tool that's used by Colombian um, police and military and so on uh, to go and use a you know, interface with a machine learning model to see whether or not, um, uh, you know, whether or not it's likely that a particular area in the rainforest is being illegally mined by, uh, by gold miners. And that was all done uh, with, with the exception of the map, uh, which I had to produce, um, which is a custom Dash component. Uh, you can see that actually all of this was done by people with no real familiar, uh, familiarity with uh, web development or anything like that, just data scientists who are more happy with you know, uh, PCAing things than they are with necessarily um, you know, developing JavaScript libraries. Uh, we are also looking to open source that uh, interface into the leaflet map um, over the next next few months. <coughs> um, and so, mo kind of moving on towards towards the end, how is it that you should get the most out of Dash? If you want to start going and building Dash applications at the moment, um, what what would your my advice to you be? Uh, and so, there are four tips that I'm, I'm going to suggest and go through at the moment. The first one is to organise your app, be disciplined. Um, uh, I'll, I'll come to this in just, just a second. Um, the second one is to actually start, uh, um, well, second, third, and fourth, they're all to start kind of tooling up um, how you use Dash in your teams as well. Uh, to build your app using something called a factory function, and then that allows you to do something called, root, well, well, to do routing and navigation, which we'll come to briefly in a moment or so. Uh, and then at the end, I'll talk about how we you know, plan to actually make the most out of Dash and, and, and tool up possibly with the community um, uh, towards the end of this talk. Um, so the very first one, uh, organize your application. Um, and so it, it's, uh, I think something that's uh, become clear to me is Dash is a very novel and experimental technology. Uh, people refer to the documentation all the time, which as they should. Uh, the docs, though, will always display an app in a single file. And so the result can be at times, for, especially with people who might be familiar with Python notebook coding, uh, is that we get kind of 2,000 line single file Dash apps, which obviously are somewhat unwieldy. Um, it might seem like a very basic piece of advice, but uh, that kind of two cultures that we've uh, identified before, it's, uh, it's something that we've had to kind of um, talk about in our team. Um, <clears throat> think about how you split up your code into kind of logical um, units and files. Uh, that's kind of very basic advice and so on. Um, we, we also try to run um, uh, apps at Decision Lab using the kind of the main interface there, so you can run something as a module rather than have to run a specific script. Um, so a standard Dash app or like a, a component inside a Dash app as we kind of, or a module, sorry, or um, as we envisage it at the moment, will generally have this kind of the main file to actually run the app, um, this sort of uh, app file which will kind of manage how the app is, uh, app is kind of created and so on. Um, and then we separate our callbacks from our layouts and then often we'll have um, other kind of uh, associated utils files and that kind of thing. But, um, but I'd say the big thing here is to make sure you separate your callbacks from your layouts from your app. Um, which allows you to run just like we do here, um, you know, uh, as a module rather than uh, rather than as a script. The next one is to build your app using a factory function, um, which might be an unfamiliar term to, to some, um, but if you're coming from a Flask world, it's a, it's a very common thing to do, um, because this allows, in, in my opinion, you to better control and to kind of better facilitate um, routing and navigation. Now, routing and navigation are what allow you to have more than one. Uh, it, it, certainly in Dash, have more than one kind of feature um, inside your app because you're able to have different uh, different pages. Uh, so, at Decision Lab, and there's an example here in uh, in the code. I think it's uh, App Six. Um, you can see uh, that we've abstracted the Dash interface um, from the standard uh, callbacks and layouts decorators. Uh, and so we actually have our own class now, which just records all of our um, decorators that are coming into our app and all of our uh, sorry, all of our um, uh, callbacks and all of our layouts that are coming into the app. Uh, then we have a kind of a base route that allows us to control um, which particular component is displayed at which particular path in, in our, inside our app. Uh, and so a standard app now would look something more like this, where you, we're importing a couple of different sets of features, which might have, um, so here I've got, uh, I've, I've 
shamelessly stolen the code that I used earlier. So here I've got two lists. One is a shopping list and one is a to-do list. Um, and so you can see now that we're just importing the, the two different modules there. Um, and then we're able to uh, run it, uh, decide which one is run um, using our, our kind of base layout here. And our, we've got a callback that, uh, that manages this. Um, and so uh, please feel free to kind of like look through this, these uh, examples at a bit more leisure. But you can see that if we actually run this app now, uh, we're able now to have, uh, so we've got here, we have three particular um, options for our layout. We've got a home page that we're on at the moment. But we've also got our to-do list and our shopping list, which are completely kind of separate from one another. So if I put something into my shopping list, it will stay in my shopping list, but then I can also put it in my to-do list. Uh, so now we have two separate lists. Uh, that you can use and sort of manage through a little um, almost like pseudo framework to uh, to keep your uh, your app kind of disciplined and lean rather than having huge files with them um, uh, rather than having huge files that have lots of um, unwieldy code in them um, now finally as well I want to uh, touch on um, what I call like tooling up dash um, if you implement um, the like I said the factory function approach before and you're able to abstract actually defining what should go into your um, your web application from actually executing it and running it. Um, so we have, like I said before, that, that class to manage the application uh, and then build it. You can actually start to integrate lots of other useful tools and um, facilities for your data um, well, in my, my position, for my, my data scientist to be able to uh, um, you know, use and exploit without having to worry too much about um, for example, integrating with a MongoDB database or um, making an API request to another service, that can all be abstracted out so that um, you know, data scientists can focus more on the important stuff, which is um, you know, maybe a machine learning model or how that model is going to be used. Um, and so we've done this through implementing dependency injection into all of our callbacks and our layouts uh, using a, a Google um, a Google dependency injection framework. Uh, and if this is something that kind of interests you or that you might want to look at doing for your own uh, your own projects, please do get in touch because um, I'd love to have the time to open source that properly and, uh, and kind of um, really make it available. Um, and so just coming to this final point now, um, there's a question that you have to ask yourself about when do you want to stop using Dash and start building um, what I've termed here like a proper web application. So by that, I mean something that you might ship to production rather than um, something that's a proof of concept that you might kind of use to iterate with a client or maybe, you know, uh, an internal project. Um, so Dash is great. Um, I really must stress this enough that I, although I, I criticize, uh, you know, or say point out some of the, the weaknesses of Dash and things that you can't do, on the whole, it is actually really good. And I never cease to be amazed by what people can produce and how quickly they can produce it using a very simple Dash framework. And um, it allows this kind of like rapid development by non-specialists. Non um, and it's also informed web development, to a, in a sense, that rather than uh, a data scientist uh, having to hand over lots of um, you know, their, their code or their idea to a software engineer and, and then see it either produced the way they want or not produced the way they want, they can actually build it themselves and actually start to produce something that's really, um, you know, really focused onto the particular mathematical task that we have uh, in mind at Decision Lab. And likewise with lots of other um, tasks that you might have. But it's also very rapid UI development, and that's a big problem. Um, I mean, you've got to, got to ask yourself, are you creating a technical debt? Um, you know, if your app's going to be built in JavaScript eventually, uh, why are you doing a proof of concept in pure Python? Like, is it not better to invest early in uh, you know, JavaScript uh, it, within your team? And there's also that point where, yes, it's a, uh, UI development that's been informed by maybe your data scientist or the person leading your project. But are they the right person to, to do that? Is using the Dash the right framework to, to go about trying that? Surely, maybe you should start with a user researcher or a UX consultant to start building a production application. Um, so these are all questions that you have to uh, you know, ask if you want to create your, um, uh, you know, your own Dash app. Um, there's also areas here that we should talk about, like authentication, testing, something I haven't covered here, uh, and other kind of complex interactions with third-party libraries are things that haven't really been, to date, properly addressed and covered in, in the Dash community. There's also that issue with heavy loads and uh, you know, the, the performance thing that I mentioned before. Um, so final point, Dash is great for facilitating very rapid development of data-driven interfaces and dashboards. Uh, <coughs> investing a bit of time allows you to go very, very far uh, inside and in creating a Dash app. But ultimately, front-end developers will still have a job after Dash kind of takes off. So thank you very much. Um, and <laughs> uh, please do get in touch. Oh, sorry. Uh,
Ah. Well, you can shout. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm wondering if uh, Dash is at all amenable to transpiling uh, into uh, a web, uh, uh, what's it, web assembly or something like that. Uh, not to my knowledge at present, no. Rather than taking like a transpilation approach, um, Dash is more focused on uh, actually wrapping around um, React components. So. Uh, there isn't direct transpilation at the moment. There are projects which transpile JavaScript into, uh, sorry, which transpile Python into JavaScript. I can't remember the names of those or what, what they do. I know that that, that does exist. Um, as to WebAssembly, um, not to my knowledge at the moment, but with typing annotations now, the interaction and things like Oxide, putting, um, you know, taking Python, putting it into Rust, and then putting it into WebAssembly could be a really interesting thing in the future. Okay, thanks. Cool, thanks. Um, oh. I have a comment and a question. Yep. Uh, First, uh, it is clear that uh, the developer cannot escape from understanding HTML. You are writing yeah. HTML in Python. Yeah. So, so you need to understand H HTML, and mm -hmm. a typical data scientist is not familiar with it, maybe. Mm -hmm. And a question mm -hmm. is uh, how debugging works, because mm -hmm. some of the events happens on the client side, mm -hmm. the li click listeners, or, and, yeah. and the rest are in the server side, so yeah. how, how it is working. Uh, well, you're right that a developer has to have um, uh, or, you know, at least some basic familiarity with, with HTML, um, although that, that generally hasn't, hasn't really been a problem. I think most people have been quite, quite familiar with it. Um, you're right, there are certainly occasions where you'll get a complex bug that might be something to do with the, the front end uh, and something that's happening in JavaScript rather than the back end. Um, they, they tend to be bugs in the Dash framework itself or in a custom component that you've made. Um, and rather than uh, the, the actual established components, which themselves are very, very stable generally, uh, and will often have a quite a helpful debug message that allows you to kind of figure out what's, what's going on. But, thank you. Great. I have one question. Oh, look. Uh, have you tried Altair? Uh, have I tried what, sorry? This Altair, there's another interactive library called Altair. Uh, no, but uh, if you send me details, that would be, be great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.